Welcome back, guys. Um, hi, and uh, thank you for joining us again. I'm Sam. Um, I am not a Cal Poly student. I work here at <laughs> Sloan Newman. Um, and I'm here joined again with our lovely Karen, who, um, Karen Schindler, who uh, has given us all these great lectures before, and now we dive into something a little extra that's been requested by you guys. And um, I don't know if you want to take it over and okay. explain it to us. Yeah, thank you, Sam, mm -hmm. and a special um, hello to all of you who are tuning in again. Um, and a special shout out to our technical operator, Finn, who's okay. behind the cameras tonight. So, Okay, so I will start with a prayer, but this time I'm going to start with an Advent prayer because we're going to be talking about Advent. Did you say that? I didn't say Advent, oh. <laughs> but yeah. Well, now you know. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail and blessed be the hour and the moment in which the Son of God was born of the most pure blessed Virgin Mary at midnight in Bethlehem in the piercing cold. In that hour vouchsafe, O oh my God, to hear my prayer and grant my petitions through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, our Mother of Mercy, pray for us. St. John Henry Newman, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so Advent. A time that is really missed in today's uh, society uh, because we leap right from Thanksgiving into Christmas. Um, but Advent is a really important time, as I've told many of you. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about why that is. But before we understand Advent, we have to lay out the context of Advent, which is the liturgical context. And uh, so we have to look at this word liturgy, which is a Greek word, liturgia, made up of two smaller Greek words, lido, meaning public, and ergon, meaning work. So the, a literal meaning of liturgy is public work, or the work of the people. Now, you might be wondering, Okay, public work, work of the people, how did liturgy end up um, associated with church or worship? Is there something to do with public work or work of the people and worship? In fact, there is. Um, and this uh, should come as no surprise to us because um, if you remember, if you recall our conversations about Christ, uh, Christ is the logos, right? Or the rational principle governing all creation, or the blueprint in which all of creation was created. St. Paul talks about the predestination of all, all men and all things in Christ. Okay, but what is Christ? Who is Christ? Well, he's the second person of the Blessed Trinity, 
who fully receives his existence and then gives it back to the Father in love. Now, on a creaturely level, that's worship. So, all of creation was meant, after the pattern of Christ, to receive its existence from the Father and to give it back to him in love. Um, which is a cycle, actually, and we're going to be talking about cycles pretty soon here. Um, now, um, if, if you were to study the ancient civilizations or even visit uh, places where civilizations began, places like the Indus River Valley or the Maya, Mayan people or Mexico or whatever, you would see and, and, and if you read about ancient Rome, ancient Greece, all these civilizations revolve around worship, right? Because what's the prominent uh, building around which the whole town or the city or the whole uh, civilization of the people is centered, except a temple? Um, so man has had this innate tendency to worship from very ancient times. Um, and Christopher Dawson talks about this. Uh, Christopher Dox Dawson is considered to be the greatest English-speaking Catholic historian of our time. And this is what he has to say. In all ages, the first creative works of a culture are due to a religious inspiration and dedicated to a religious end. The temples of the gods are the most enduring works of man. Religion stands at the threshold of all the great literatures of the world. Philosophy is its offspring and is a child which constantly returns to its parent. And the same is true of social institutions. Kingship and law are religious institutions, and even today they have not entirely divested themselves of their numinous character. All the institutions of family and marriage and kinship have a religious background and have been maintained and are still maintained by formidable social sanctions. So, this... Uh, very foundational connection between man and worship, um, the public work being worship. Um, now, if you remember from St. Paul when he talked about the predestination of all men and all things in Christ, it's not just us that is called to worship. It's all of all things, right? Um, if you recall, at the very beginning of creation in Genesis, uh, Adam and Eve weren't created in a void. They were created in a garden. And if you go to the Hebrew account of Genesis, you see a lot of references in the account of the garden to the temple. And um, I, I'm not qualified to give you all the references right now. Um, but one very obvious one that we were just talking about actually at, in scripture study this last Thursday um, is the stones that are mentioned in the Garden of Eden in Genesis are the same stones that end up in the temple um, and they also end up in the New Jerusalem or the Holy City in this uh, in, in the account of St. John, when he talks mm -hmm. about at the very end of time. So there's a lot of um, connections between the garden in which Adam and Eve were placed and the temple. So once again, there's this connotation of worship. And then God gives Adam and Eve a commandment. What does he say? He says, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, what does subdue mean? We would tend to think, being products of a very technological culture, that subdued just means to dominate the earth, to exercise power over it, and to use it for anything we deem is useful for us or whatever. But that's actually yeah. not the case. Yeah, I, I was remembering a talk we were having before. Uh -huh. <laughs> the, when, um, I'm a big fan of Martin Heidegger, the, yes. the German philosopher. and he talks about how the Bible became this user manual for us, right? Mm -hmm. But in a context of where we get, we are given the excuse to manipulate and for it to be, for us to be its masters. And even, 
Okay, so it manipulate we, creation, you mean, yes. and to be the masters of the world, the and, world and the universe and for our own purposes and stuff. Where that's not exactly what you're saying. It's more like trying to um, orient things to a proper direction, right? This sort yeah, of exactly. Wor proper worship. Exactly. So well, and Martin Heidegger was right to call that out. Mm -hmm. The problem is he didn't understand the Bible. So, um, yeah, so we know that subdue can't have that meaning because if we recall from our um, uh, discussion on the Trinity, uh, it's the ground of existence, right? All existence springs from the Trinity. God is being itself, and so the Trinity is the foundation of all being. So we learn how existence is to go from looking at the Trinity. And there is nothing about power and domination in the Trinity. It's all love and surrender. That's, that's all it is, right? So this subdue word has to have something to do with that. And remember we said this love and surrender on a creaturely level is worship. So the commandment is really to bring the cosmos into this same posture of worship in Christ that men are called to. And in fact, um, Christ is the first one that does that. Um, with his choice of the day on which he rises from the dead. He doesn't just pick a random day in the week. He picks Sunday. Okay, now why is that significant? Well, Sunday uh, is the first day of creation. It's the day on which Christ, uh, God said, let there be light, and creation began. And we know this because in the Jewish law, the Sabbath was... The, the day on which God rested and which all the Jews had to rest on was, this, was Saturday or the seventh day. But wouldn't that also be considered a cycle of worship, as you say? Like um, the whole Sabbath, establishing Sabbath as a day in which you have to, um, there's a certain set of rules and it's kind of a way to align yourself. Wouldn't that be yes. the first thing? Yeah, so it was, you, yeah. Excellent. I mean, the Jewish law already had this idea of establishing um, the or, or establishing their worship or arranging their worship within the cycles of creation mm -hmm. or this this the seven day week of creation. Mm -hmm. um, but but we do know f because of that that on the Sabbath everybody rests, God rests. So Sunday is the day on which creation begins. Well, Christ chooses Sunday again, the day after the Sabbath to rise from the dead. Why? Because he's showing that creation is now reborn. There's a new birth in Christ. Okay, but not only that, not only does he choose Sunday, but he chooses the Sunday in the Passover. Now, by Jewish law, and here's another reference to what you were saying, in Jewish law, the Passover was celebrated at the time when the lunar cycle came into full harmony with the solar cycle because it was celebrated at the first full moon in the spring equinox. So the spring equinox is, is the point in the, the calendar year where the sun is the highest, it is its highest point above the earth. So it's fullest brightness. And the full moon is at, it point, at, is at the point where it can most fully reflect that light. So it's when the moon and the sun are most fully in line with each other. And when those two cycles are in line with each other, everything else is in line with it too because this moon and the this, and this sun govern all the other cycles in the earth. They, they, they govern the days, the weeks, the months, the years, the harvesting, the planting, um, even the cycles of our own body are uh, are, are grounded in the um, cycles of the sun and the moon. Um, so, uh, so Christ rises at this time, and um, the moon here, the moon and the sun here are very symbolic in and of themselves, because the moon is a symbol of creation, because it waxes and wanes, mm -hmm. um, it changes. Uh, the sun is a symbol of Christ, um, because it's fixed right it's not fixed but it um well that's a whole nother conversation but well, i mean because 
In a heliocentric model, it is fixed. In a geocentric model, it is not. But that's a can of worms we're not going to open right now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what were you going to say? Well, the, the 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 sun is like almost guaranteed. Like it doesn't. Oh, have, absolutely. It doesn't have a. It doesn't change on us. Exactly. Whereas the the moon has this this chaotic property to it. Changeability to mm -hmm. it. Yes. In fact, that's the one thing you can always depend on, right? If nothing else, you can always depend on the sun rising every morning and mm -hmm. setting every evening. But um, in Psalm 19, which is a psalm about the stars and the sun and the moon, Christ is likened to the sun that comes from the east um, out of his bride chamber, like a bridegroom coming out of his bride chamber. Mm -hmm. um, so, so once again, you see this reference in the psalms of the the moon or the symbol of creation coming into full harmony with the sun or Christ. Um, and by the way, this is precisely why in the old liturgy, all the priests face the altar and why all the altars face the east. Mm -hmm. Because it was in a posture of worship or waiting for the bridegroom to come, who would come from the east. And um, that's why Benedict XVI really recommended that all the churches go back to Ad Orientum, or facing the east, um, uh, several years ago yeah. when, he, when he issued some reforms of the liturgy. Um, and there's a reference in Lord of the Rings mm. to this. Um, and it's in The Two Towers, the second book. And um, Gandalf is going to get reinforcements for Theoden. Um, in the in this big battle and he, Gandalf is a Christ figure but he tells Theoden uh, look to my coming in the east he says look to the east and I will come at dawn on the fifth day is that is that why he, he was Gandalf the white at that point right he was Gandalf yes the, he was Gandalf he was the, the white at the point well yeah that's why that right. has to do with the fact that he's a Christ figure mm. Yeah, because he, he dies. He, he dies and rise, rose again. And then he rises more resplendent. Yeah. Yeah, like Christ. Um, and and so, so once again, what do we have here? We have all of the cosmos in this act of the resurrection coming into union with uh, its bridegroom or Christ. And this is the whole point of the resurrection, right? And in fact, this is what the Eucharist is about too, um, this, this taking up of the cosmos into worship. Because what is changed into the body and blood of Christ except bread and wine, which is fruit of the earth and work of human hands, mm -hmm. right? So there's a reference to the cosmos right there. Um, so there's, uh, I want to give this quotation from Ratzinger. Um, oh, before I do that. Um, so yes, this is the point of the resurrection. Did I say that? where um, so Christ rising at this time brings the cosmos into union with the bridegroom or her himself and this is the work of the resurrection and this is what the church continues mm -hmm. with her liturgical year how does she do that well the first thing she does when she establishes the liturgical year which is the uh, yearly cycle of feasts that happen um, she pinpoints Easter, or she, she establishes the day on which Easter will be celebrated. And it's always celebrated on the first Sunday, after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. Hmm. So once again, she's repeating this, this, this um, taking up of the cosmos, the, this symbolic um, recreation of the cosmos, or in its union with Christ, the bridegroom. Um, and then, once she establishes Easter, all the other feasts of the church year that are movable, meaning they're not on a fixed date, get arranged. Mm -hmm. so, um, so from Easter, you have the establishment of Pentecost and mm -hmm. then Corpus Christi, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, the first Sunday of Advent, all the movable feasts. They all shift according to where mm -hmm. Easter falls every I've, year. I've asked you this before um, several times now <laughs> that I asked you, whether or not, let's wait for this sound to go away. <laughs> so, the... E <laughs> Give it a sec, I'll edit this out. Okay, okay. so the, the, that day that it's used, you know, Easter, 
would that be our new year? Oh, oh, yeah. The liturgy. No, it's not the new year. The new year starts in Advent, so we'll get to that. But it is the reference point gotcha. around which the entire cycle of time and cycle of space that the cosmos is composed of uh, revolves, right? Um, and it's the point, well, if you think of eternity, or time as the unfolding of eternity, as Plato says, um, the point at which it unfolds is the resurrection, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's when Christ comes to recreate meaning. Um, it's the, the point at which heaven comes down, unfolds itself, and then takes earth back up into it. Fascinating. So, um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's heaven comes down, sanctifies the whole cosmos, the whole mm -hmm. liturgical year, and then brings it back up. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so that gets into the beauty of establishing the cosmos in this posture of worship. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is it makes the whole cosmos a sacrament. And what do I mean by that? Well, all you Harry Potter fans can relate to this. I always, um, because Harry Potter is popular, I like to associate sacrament with a portal. Because if you remember in the first book, um, where, I don't even remember their names, like Harry Potter's on the train. I mean, I read it so long ago, but on the train, and he gets to the 13th and a half station or something like yeah. that. Okay, and he gets off, and he's in a completely different world, right, that nobody else can access. The muggles, what are they yeah, called? Yeah, so the humans. <laughs> yeah. They can't get in there, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, a sacrament is like the 13th and a half station. It's where you can access the divine world, okay? So the whole cosmos becomes this portal or this sacrament um, where, where this exchange, this giving of... Of, of God to us and, and our regifting of ourselves back to God in love happens. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is very evident in a place like Italy, which is extremely Catholic, and Mexico too, I'm mm -hmm. sure, um, because everything is sanctified. All the big holidays mm -hmm. are all Catholic holidays. And even their, you know, their, their festivals, like their wine festivals, their olive oil festivals, they all start on the Feast of some saint. Mm. Everything has its own blessing, its own ritual, and just everything is, just has this idea of exchange with the Creator. Yeah, I remember certain, like, holidays there were, when I stayed in Mexico, there was, um, I can't remember, but I know it was religious, and it was... Um, it was because of some saint. Uh -huh. And it was like, you get to go to any house and the house has to give you like, like water and some treats. Oh, wow. it, it almost sounds like Halloween, but it's not. It's, uh -huh. And it's on some random day, I can't think. But I remember I was in the house and we have to prep this water and we have to make these snacks. It's like, why? Because it's, it's a holiday and like, uh -huh. what about it? Well, we have to give these away. Yeah. Like, what? I don't understand. And, and, and I remember looking it up and yeah, it was based on a saint. And I don't know what it was. And there's so many other random holidays. And mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no classes on so many days. And it's all because it's some feast day of someone. Yeah, so. well, and there is this beautiful, there's the Mayan temple right there on our <laughs> screensaver. <laughs> yeah. But um, speaking of, but, um, oh, yeah, there's this one town in Italy. I mean, I think there are several of them mm -hmm. um, that where the whole town celebrates the Feast of Corpus Christi. The whole mm -hmm. town. So, and, and all the streets are decorated with flowers. Like, they make carpets of flowers with all these religious symbols. Mm -hmm. Like the symbol of, you know, the P and the X and the cross and lilies and everything. And, and the chalice and the host. In um, uh, flower petals. It's the most amazing thing. And the whole town comes out to celebrate Corpus Christi. So, um, yeah, this, is, this was the whole point of the liturgy, right? Mm -hmm. To make the whole cosmos sacred, to turn the whole world into that garden that Adam, that Adam and Eve were placed in, that, that place of worship. Mm -hmm. um, so here's that quotation by Ratzinger. The dying and rising moon become the sign in the cosmos of death and resurrection. 
The son of the first day becomes the messenger of Christ who comes forth like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. The hour of Jesus makes its appearance again and again within the unity of cosmic and historical time. Through the feast, we enter into the rhythm of creation and into God's plan for human history. Hmm. Um, I think there is another... Oh yeah, here's another one. Liturgy is opening of the gates of this world so that God can enter in so that people who believe can enter in and can meet God. These two movements go together, the spiritual awakening of men, the procession of history so as to be able to go meet the Lord in his city, and the coming of the Lord who approaches us, the encounter in the mystery of the Eucharist in which we set out to follow him, and in which he comes to us and gives himself to us so that we can go farther with him and open wide the gates of the world for his entrance and for our going forth to him. Um, and this reminds me of that beautiful story in the Lamb's Supper that Scott Hahn tells about that Slavic emperor who sends em uh, emissaries to Constantinople, to mm -hmm. Hagia Sophia. And I don't know if any of the audience has gone to Hagia Sophia, but it's this magnificent church, which has unfortunately just been turned into a mosque by the Turkish ruler, prime minister, whoever he is. Um, but anyway, he sent them there to inquire about the Catholic religion, and they came back and they said this to the emperor. We went to Greece, and the Greeks led us to the edifices where they worship their god, and we knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For on earth there is no such splendor or such beauty, and we are at a loss how to describe it. We only know that God dwells there among men, and their service is fairer than the ceremonies of other nations and we cannot forget that beauty. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's in this context then that we understand Advent. Mm -hmm. So Advent, to answer your question, is in fact the beginning of the church year. Um, why is that? Because it's the time of waiting for Christ. It's the time which we begin this waiting of Christ, and it represents the 4,000 years um, between the promise of the Savior, which God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden after they had fallen, uh, he tells the serpent, um, I shall put enmities between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. So he talks about the, the enmities of the woman's seed or Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and so 4,000 years pass, though, between that time and the time when he actually comes. And Advent, in fact, is a season of four Sundays, mm -hmm. representative of those 4,000 years. Um, and we uh, see that it's a time when Christ is not there because it's very subdued. The, the priest wears purple. There's no organ. There's not supposed to be organ. I know a lot of churches use it, but they're not supposed to. And there's no flowers, there's no Gloria, which is a song, you know. Is it, is it, okay, back to that organ thing, like, is it, there's supposed to be music at all? No. Well, no. singing. Singing, so no instrumentation. Right, because an organ and other instruments are, you know, kind of uh, indicative of celebration. And we don't celebrate yet because we're waiting. So, um, it's super, very solemn. Yeah, and so, and the Advent hymns are not festive like the ones of Christmas. They're very nostalgic and mysterious. But there's a Gloria. Right? No, there's no Gloria. Alleluia? There is an Alleluia. It's and not, okay, it's not completely subdued because it's joyful expectation, right? Because we okay. know Christ is coming. It's not like Lent, which is completely penitential and looks forward to the death of Christ. Um, this one looks forward in joyful expectation for the coming of the bridegroom, mm -hmm. but it's still very um, cognizant of its need for the bridegroom and the bridegroom's absence, right? And that's why it's very muted. The, there's still an alleluia, but the joy is very muted. And um, like I said, the hymns, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, has this very, you know, it's very, it's not celebratory. It, it's, it's very nostalgic and mysterious. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. Um, hark a mystic voice is sounding. Um, so um, the liturgical prayers too reflect this. It, they're ones of longing. 
Drop down dew from above ye heavens and let the clouds rain the just one. Let the earth be opened and bud forth a savior. Uh, another prayer, stir up thy might and come that from the threatening danger of our sins, by thy protection we may, be de we may deserve to be rescued and saved. But as I was saying, they're ones of hope. Um, because we know that Christ is going to come because mm -hmm. of the promise. All they that wait on thee shall not be confounded. And St. Paul in the Romans, Now is the hour for us to rise from sleep. Our salvation is nearer than when we believed. Out of Sion, the loveliness of his beauty, God shall come. So these are all selections from the readings. So, and they're ones of joy too. Um, like I said, the Alleluia is still there. And... Um, the exact midway point of Advent mm -hmm. is the third Sunday of Advent, because we had two weeks preceding, and then two weeks after. Although, I should make a note here. There's not exactly always four weeks. Mm -hmm. There are always four Sundays, but not four weeks, and that all depends on where Easter falls, remember? Yeah. Because the first Sunday of Advent is movable, so sometimes you get chipped out of a full week. But... If there were four weeks, the third Sunday would be in the exact midway point, and it's pink. Yeah. And it's called Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete is Latin for rejoice. And the reading is, uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The Lord is nigh. Be nothing solicitous, but in everything by prayer, let your petitions be, no be made known to God. And why do we look forward with joy? Because our Savior is coming. And this is recalls one of the readings in the old liturgy for the second Sunday of Advent when John the Baptist sends two disciples to Jesus and says, are you the one that's to come or should we look for someone else? Mm. And Christ says, well, look at what follows me. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise again, the poor have the gospel preached to them. So what does Christ bring? This healing, this recreation, and so it's an exciting time because we know he's coming. And then as the church gets closer to Advent, uh, she starts reading or she starts singing the O antiphons. And the O antiphons are the antiphons for the Magnificat. If anyone remembers chanting Vespers, um, there's an antiphon or a verse that said before that Magnificat and afterward. And um, beginning on the 17th of December and ending on the 23rd of December, the church says the O antiphons, and they are called O antiphons because they start with O. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they um, use all the names of Christ that we get from the Old Testament. So we have the first, O Wisdom, O Adonai, O Root of Jesse, O Key of David, O Dayspring, um, it's O Oriens is the Latin. Mm -hmm. So um, that's once again a reference to the sun coming from the east. Um, o King of the Nations and O Emmanuel are God with us. And then on the last Sunday, the church puts the spotlight on the most important person of Advent, who is Our Lady, obviously, because... Um, she is most closely associated with his coming. In fact, she's the woman that was promised in Genesis, right? The woman who would crush the head of the serpent. Um, so she's the one that um, makes possible the whole coming of Christ. And so she's the one whose expectant longing is the most perfect and the one, therefore, with whom we should unite in this season of Advent. Um, in fact, a lot of her biggest feasts are celebrated during this time. So you have the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th. You have the Feast of Our Lady Guadalupe on December 12th. You have the Feast of the Expectation of the Blessed Virgin on December 18th. Um, yeah, just lots of, uh, um, lots of feasts. And you know, I neglected to mention um, Advent devotionally starts on the Feast of St. Andrew on November 30th every year. And then liturgically, it's the Sunday closest to the Feast of St. Andrew. Um, oh, and you know what? I <laughs> cut out a whole section here that I just remembered. Um, I was talking about how the resurrection brings the whole cosmos into union yeah. with Christ. Um, but there are two other 
Uh, fixed feasts, meaning with precise dates in the church calendar, could have cosmic significance too. And they are the Feast of the Incarnation and the Feast of Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why this is significant here, because you have to understand the cosmic significance. So the first one is really big in the Eastern Church, the Feast of the Incarnation. And um, that's March 25th during the spring equinox. In, the, in, in fact, in the Caesarean calendar or the calendar of Julius Caesar, that was the day of the spring equinox. Mm -hmm. It's been adjusted since because there's been adjustments to the calendar. But this, traditionally in the church, this was also the day on which supposedly God began creation on Let There Be Light, although mm -hmm. that it seems very anachronistic. I don't know how <laughs> you have a March you know 25th that? before you have creation. But anyway, that was the tradition. And it was also the day on which Abraham sacrificed Isaac, which is very symbolic. And then um, you have the, the, it's the feast when uh, Christ takes flesh mm. in the womb of the Blessed Virgin. Is there one? And the, and the day on which he was crucified. So they all oh, come together on March 25th. Hmm. Yeah. And those, um, hmm. And Just that's the, like the high point, right? Because it's the spring equinox, so it's when the, the days start getting really long and there's new life on earth. Okay. And then nine months later, you have December 25th, which is Christmas, which is not so big in the East, much bigger in the West, um, in the Eastern Church. But that December 25th was on the Caesarean calendar, the day of the winter solstice. So it was the December 24th was the shortest day of the year, and December 25th was the day when, on which the day started growing lighter and longer. Christ is the light of the world. He comes into the darkness and he brings his light. So very significant here. But anyway, so Advent starts around this time, hmm. in, in the late time. Um, when the days are getting really short, and then they start, and then on Christmas they start to lengthen again. Um, okay, so ways we can celebrate Advent, there is the Jesse tree, which is, um, this is the most traditionally Catholic practice, and it's unfortunate that it's the one that's most obscure that we are the least familiar with, but the Jesse tree is um, the practice of having a tree, like a Christmas tree here, <laughs> <laughs> except it's not decorated with Christmas ornaments. It's actually decorated with ornaments that represent the different events in the Old Testament that led up to the coming of Christ. And it begins with this prophecy in the garden of the woman. Um, it goes it, it goes to Noah, right, who has the ark, who saves the world. It goes to Abraham and Isaac. Mm -hmm. I mean, there the Old Testament has literally hundreds of types, prefigurements, prophecies of, of, of Christ, right? So the Jesse tree is really can be really rich because it can delve into all these um, different types and prophecies. Um, so it becomes a really lovely way to celebrate Advent. Um, um, so the Jesse tree gets its name from Jesse, who is the father of David and the great, great, great grandfather of Jesus. And um, from the prophecy of Isaiah that says, a branch shall spring out of Jesse. Mm. Um, and uh, a branch shall spring out of the root of Jesse. That's, cool. that's Christ, right? I okay. don't really know what Jesse's tree looks like, or maybe I do, I just don't know. Well, that's the, the unfortunate thing. It's the least familiar uh, Advent practice. But, but this it, doesn't count. No. No. I mean, maybe I'm Isaac's <laughs> a little bit. His, his ornament, repent. <laughs> <laughs> maybe for John the Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> no, a anyway, um, so... Um, Okay, so the next one is the Advent calendar, which is similar to the Jesse tree, except it's in calendar form, and mm. every day you have a little door to open, and it was supposed to be like the Jesse tree, where it had the prophecies and the types of Christ in the Old Testament, but now it's really become secularized, where you just have candy canes, and <laughs> yeah, it's I so know, banal. I did not know that was a, a thing from us. Oh. You know, from the Catholic Church or oh, yeah. thing. Well, what should come as a surprise, will probably come as a surprise to most people, is that the Advent wreath is not Catholic. Mm. <laughs> I mean, it is now, but it actually um, 
originated with the Lutherans, the German Lutherans. Um, but it is a beautiful practice, you know, the, the, the four candles representing the 4,000 mm -hmm. years, the pink candle for Gaudete Sunday, so it works. Which now we know is not an arbitrary Right, right, thing. it's not arbitrary, it's the halfway point. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a good thing to know. Yeah, okay, and then there's the Christmas Novena. I know typically a Novena is nine days, mm -hmm. but this is this begins on the Feast of St. Andrew traditionally and ends on Christmas Eve. And it's just the practice of saying that prayer that I began this class with, the Hail and Blessed, mm. 15 times a day. Um, it doesn't have to be consecutive. They, like no, you can spread it out during the day. Um, mm. I would always, to make sure I got it in, I I've would... I've never heard 15. What's so yeah, significant about I, I 15? I don't know. That's just the practice. You say it 15 times a day. Okay, I now would, I want to know why. I'm sure there's a reason why. Well, it's not liturgical. It's oh, devotional. It's and if it's, not, ah. if it's not liturgical, there doesn't have to be a reason. It's just a devotion that has to all, 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 all of these? Yeah, there are more devotional. Because they okay. don't, these don't have to do with the liturgy. I see. Yeah. Huh. The well, liturgy is the, se the four Sundays of Advent yeah. and the readings, okay? Yeah. These are just ways we can get into this, the spirit of Advent in our own homes or... Yeah, yeah. so instead of um, prolonging Christmas or starting Christmas a little too early, this is something we could... Well, yeah, this, there's this whole beautiful feast of the church year, right? And cosmic, think cosmic, right? The days are getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. It's not time to be celebrating the coming of Christ, which comes on the winter solstice, right? Yeah. Um, there's plenty of time afterwards, because in the liturgical year, um, Christmas doesn't get over until January 13th, which mm -hmm. is the octave of Epiphany. And in the old calendar, it didn't even get over until February 2nd, Feast yeah, of the Purification. My mom would tell me that too. It's, it's, yeah. I, I would say, let's bring down the Christmas, the Christmas lights. So no. We, it's still Christmas until February. Like, yeah, oh, and then, and then, then so um, at Christmas time, you know, the days do start getting longer. Yeah. And, and then, of course, there's all this celebration in the liturgy. And it's just a shame that we have lost, we're just out of sync with that. Yeah, well, I mean, in, like, I think even some churches start taking their decorations off before I Christmas know. is over, right? I know, yes. So, so it just feels like... And they like start should, putting it up. Yeah, they start, yeah, it's... I it's mean, weird. it's so unliturgical. It's so uncosmic. Wow. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so the significance of Advent, that's a nice segue into the last section of this talk, which is why should we have Advent at all? Well, um... It's a very important season, and um, before we can understand this, we have to realize it's not just this happy time of remembering, you know, the 4,000 years mm -hmm. of, of waiting for Christ, and then he comes 2,000 years ago, and yay, we're all happy he came, and now we can get on with life. Mm -hmm. No. This is the liturgy, okay? And um, we haven't yet talked about the significance of the liturgy uh, in terms of the, the sacrament of the Eucharist. But because it is sacramental, it's a portal, right? And so uh, it a, a portal to the other world, which is eternal, uh, number one, but also it's that portal through which we are ex have this constant exchange with heaven. So all that to say, that anything celebrated in the liturgy is not just a remembrance or this empty symbol. It's actually a recreation through which we partake of the actual grace that was given when those events occurred. So we are actually recreating at Christmas time the coming of Christ. He's actually coming again, really and truly, in the Eucharist, on the altar, and so there, this time of waiting is also recreating the time of waiting of these 4,000 years. So we're uniting with all the patriarchs and prophets, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with King David, with the prophets, okay, with Our Lady, with Saint Joseph. We're really uniting with them in this time of prayerful expectancy and um, uh, this, uh, this brings us to 
um, the next point I want to make, which is there isn't just one coming of Christ then. Okay, there are three comings of Christ. So there is that coming of Christ that happened in history 2,000 years ago. But um, there are two more comings of Christ that we're preparing for in this season of Advent. Um, the second one has to do with his coming at the end of the world or at the end of time, right? Which is going to be a beautiful, magnificent time. Um, St. John talks about it in the book of Revelations. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So this is also what we're preparing for, right? Mm -hmm. this, this union of creation with its creator, this mm -hmm. dwelling of God with men, the time when all this tribulation that we're going through will be a thing of the past. And so it's a joyful looking ahead to this. But there's also a third coming. And the third coming is in the time in between. Mm -hmm. In between when he actually came in history and when he will be coming again at the end of time. This is the already and not yet. What do we mean by that? Well, he already came and reestablished creation into himself, right? He recreated creation. All of it was reborn and resurrected in Christ. Absolutely. But it was done like the parable he tells in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke about the leaven. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. So it's taking time for the effects of the resurrection and this recreation of Christ to make themselves felt in the world, right? It's the, the yeast that's kind of growing. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that time, um, before it actually comes to the full, you know, baking um, of the bread, which is at the end of time when God dwells with men, um, the, it recalls that passage of Paul in Romans where all of creation is groaning as in childbirth because it's bringing forth Christ, mm -hmm. you know. And we really see the effects of um, the fact that this recreation hasn't been completely felt throughout all the earth yet, um, that it's still, it's still coming to that. Um, because if we look at the earth now and the cosmos now, it's, it's very clear to us that it is not in sync with the creator, right? I mean, perhaps now more than at any other time in history, <laughs> it's completely out of sync. I mean, we're having natural disasters, um, wars, uh, plagues, coronaviruses, things like that. Um, especially in this country, I mean, men are so divided. So clearly, um, Christ has come, but w we still haven't achieved that, that uh, end point. And that's why we need an Advent, right? We need to pray for this, um, this uh, earth coming into term, this earth um, really accepting the fruits of the rede redemption and really demonstrating that the redemption has occurred. Um, and that's why, okay, so, um, and, and why is a time of expectation and prayer important? Well, we learn from the gospel that God has made it a, um, necessary criterion for prayer that one asks, seeks, and knocks. You're not going to get answers, you're not going to find answers, and you're not going to get doors open without the asking, seeking, and knocking. Um, and that's because Christ came to establish a relationship. 
right? He wants your cooperation or your participation, and that's where the asking, seeking, and knocking comes, comes into play. And that's what Advent is all about. It's joining with all these people in the Old Testament, all the, the church now, to ask and seek and knock for the coming of Christ into our time and into our age when it's so needed. Mm -hmm. Like John Paul II calls this the culture of death, right? Because mm -hmm. we have abortion going on, we have euthanasia, we have gay marriage, all this stuff. Um, and like I said, the cosmos is rebelling because we're not bringing it into worship in this um, pattern of Christ. And uh, so we really need an advent perhaps more now than at any other time in history. Um, so with that in mind, then, I want to end with a quotation from Ratzinger. And then um, we could play that film that you made for Newman. Yeah, you, you also helped me. Um, oh, yeah. OK, well, thanks for that <laughs> acknowledgment. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I mean, no, but seriously, we <laughs> sat down and we were trying to... We did, and I think it really, I, I really think it's appropriate to play here because it really captures the, where the cosmos is right now because we've fallen so far out of sync with the bridegroom or the creator. Um, we've fallen so far from this posture of worship. And so now it's really time to embrace this Advent, to really ask and seek and knock so that Christ can come again into our age in the way that is best suited to our age. Um, so here is Ratzinger, and then we'll end with that film. Come today, Lord, come into each one of us, and thus come into this age as well, visibly, historically, in a new way, as this time requires and in a manner suited to it. Yes, Lord, come and help us so that we may open the gates to you, that we may go with you when you enter. Amen. All right. And now to the film. Thank you, all of you. How long will this last? You are everywhere, yet I cannot see you. Where are you? Teach me where to look. Are we not made to see you? Why don't you show yourself? Has hate come to take your place? Is this what you wanted? Is this what I wanted? Am I nothing to you? Help me see you. Help me hear you. Don't leave me alone. Speak to me. Show yourself. Am I not good enough for you? Do you not hear me? Where are you hiding? What am I doing?
Why are you silent? Are you a secret? Are you in the secret? What do I call you? Help me feel you like I once did. Let me feel you in my soul. Let me feel you in my bones. Why do I fear? Why do I doubt? You've called me by my name before. Love that loves us, call us. Oh